So I want to thank the uh, Center for Homeland Defense and Security for having this, uh, the Apex Talks. I think it's a great opportunity for us as first responders, uh, homeland security and defense professionals come together and share ideals. On the way in this morning, my wife was driving me. She dropped me off. She was like, aren't you excited and honored to be speaking? And I was like, well, I am, but the real star of this is the problem that I'm going to be talking about uh, because we all deal with unique problems. Uh, so this is a convoluted, complex problem involving many different stakeholders. Uh, my colleagues, when I was at Tufts University, would say this is a wicked problem. It's a wicked problem indeed. The problem I want to talk to you about is, homo is uh, human trafficking. So human trafficking, let's talk about what it is first and maybe what it's not. Um, Congress in 2000 tried to define it in uh, the Victims for Trafficking Protection Act. They call it the TVPA. Uh, so they said it involves both sex and labor trafficking. So what is trafficking? It requires a coercion, a um, somehow confusion, somehow fraud, making someone involved in that either sex transaction, commercial sex transaction, or the labor transaction. It's not prostitution. It is not someone taking a job for less money. It is someone is forced to enter into that agreement. How big of a problem can this possibly be? Well, worldwide, it's huge. So there are about, um, it's a $150 billion economic impact globally. Um, there are millions involved in it, and only about 1% are ever rescued. Uh, it is the fastest growing criminal enterprise out there. So as you might expect, the Department of State for a long time was the natural agency to be in the lead in trying to counter this. Uh, but recently, in 2005, Congress updated the TVPA and they extended it to domestic trafficking and specifically involving children. Uh, that's a real challenge. This problem has come home to the United States and is something that we need to try to figure out how to solve. So in Texas, we had some of these uh, researchers, and these are academic numbers, right? So they apply formulas to a particular uh, at-risk uh, population to try to figure out what's going on. The traffickers don't want us to know the extent of the problem. Uh, in Texas, we estimated that there's 300,000 uh, trafficking victims, so that's a big problem. Uh, Texas, it, more so than any others, so this is a nationwide problem, but um, it tends to be prevalent in certain states. Uh, Texas is unique, uh, I think so anyway, but because we have such a large uh, population and also a large land mass. We share a 1,254 mile border with Mexico. We have a 365 some odd mile uh, coastline. All those are opportunities for folks to be trafficked in uh, through our uh, perimeter. It's a significant problem for us. Cartels are becoming involved because of the profitability. If you have a kilo of cocaine, you cut it, you sell it, and then you're done, you have to go get more cocaine. If you have a human product, as long as you control the product, and as long as you can stay out of the police operations, you can make money. And you can make money as long as that product can be sold. And that's an unfortunate way to look at it, but it's the reality. And so that's why it's becoming a bigger problem uh, with organized crime. The other challenge we have is it can be, it hides in plain sight. You know, people see folks, and uh, if you're a member of the public, then you don't want to get involved, you don't want to say anything, you don't want to be embarrassed, uh, and, and, and maybe you don't really know what human trafficking looks like. The other part of that challenge is prosecuting these crimes can be fairly difficult because the victims aren't always cooperative. Sometimes they don't trust the police, they don't trust law enforcement. Maybe they came from a country where the law enforcement was corrupt. Maybe they're just intimidated, they don't want to be involved with that. The other part is they're con they are scared of their trafficker. So either for themselves or for their family members, they don't want to cooperate. And the third is maybe they simply don't see themselves as victims. They came to this country from another place and even though they're in this slavery lifestyle, their life is better than it would have been where they came from. Now that's a real challenge because without a outcry from a victim, most of the statutes 
prohibit us from bringing human trafficking cases. Um, and that's significant because it's hard for us to uh, really impact or dismantle human trafficking. So why TABC? Uh, a lot of people have asked me that. And uh, we're kind of a unique organization. Uh, we're the sole regulator for 55,000 alcohol businesses in the state of Texas. We have both administrative and criminal jurisdiction. Uh, what that means simply is that one of my agents or employees can walk into any alcohol business any time of the day, ask to inspect it, ask to see the books, talk to employees, talk to customers. If there is criminal activity going on, then we will go back and get the, follow the criminal procedure to make sure we can build the criminal case. Uh, but the challenge is this is authority that no other law enforcement agency out there has. And of course, like all law enforcement organizations, and I know many of y'all, we have resource restrictions. Uh, the, for my agents, we have approximately 225 peace officers who work for me. They cover about 1,200 square miles of Texas and 300 um, permitted locations. Now, if you quickly do the math, it's not, we're not able to be very effective. And the way we conduct operations also sticks that ability. So we typically do a four-man operation, two undercover, two open. Uh, and our hope is that our undercover folks won't have to break their persona, their undercover, um, in order to make a case. So we bring them out, we send the open team in, uh, and then, then we'll arrest people or write them violations and do the things we have to do. Quickly realized when I came there, I was like, how do we do our core mission? Protect, help businesses and protect Texas communities. So we started looking at other ways. Uh, first was to raise awareness of human trafficking. Um, we worked with the Attorney General's office and the office of the governor to roll out two campaigns across the state. Um, one was Be the One uh, by the Attorney General. It was an hour-long video. The governor used his authority to make all state employees do this as an annual training requirement. We also created a targeted uh, campaign focused at our industry partners. Uh, then we got with Cecilia Abbott, the First Lady of Texas, and they came up with a digital campaign called Can You See Me? And the idea was to raise awareness amongst the public, our partners, so they could understand what human trafficking is and what it isn't and how to report it. We also created a complimentary campaign for our industry partners. And we created an app, everybody has an app nowadays, an app so that they could make a complaint about human trafficking and they could do it anonymously. All we needed was a location. What, which one of the 55,000 alcohol businesses are you talking about? The challenge becomes, when are they there? You know, and with the limited resources we have, we could hit them on a Friday or Saturday night. We can't go back in there the next Friday and Saturday night because then not too often they'll make us. And then we can't, we're not effective. So we started looking for other partners. Uh, the other partners, most of the human trafficking occurs in retail locations. Uh, so we looked for the folks that were there. We didn't want to necessarily partner with uh, bar or restaurant owners because my thought was, if it's happening there, they're probably somehow involved. So we looked for other people that go into those locations and we happened upon the beer truck drivers and the alcohol delivery drivers. Uh, so we developed a 30 minute um, training program for them. If you know anything about beer truck drivers, they go in at five o'clock in the morning, they load up, and then they make their run. They go all across communities in Texas, uh, and they're almost invisible. They go in, and sometimes there are retail employees there, sometimes they're not. Uh, they have access, because they're delivering product, and they typically go in before the public, it's open to the public. So they see things that other people don't see. So they literally became our eyes and ears. Uh, what you see on the slide are some of the training presentations that we use for them. These were based on real cases where we had worked. And this is what we would see after we went in and shut down a location for human trafficking. Occurring in the back room, occurring in a convenience store. Uh, you'll notice the uh, lady there with the tattoo. Uh, that's an example, that's her mark of ownership. She belongs to a human trafficker. Uh, and that's part of our challenge is that slave mentality. In 2019, last year, uh, we were able to document a 175% increase of human trafficking complaints and violations coming into the agency over what we got in 2017. So clearly something's working. 
Then the challenge became is, well, you gotta go investigate it. And I was like, well, I need more resources, or we need to partner with our other law enforcement organizations to figure out how we can do this. As a result of the investigations, we ended up increasing the amount of shutdowns, kicking people out of the alcohol business in Texas by 92%. Roughly about a two and a half million dollar impact to the criminal enterprises, we think. Uh, some of that's a swag. Uh, but it was a successful partnership. As a result of us going and doing these operations, and we would um, rescue these victims, we started looking for other partnerships because we're not in the services business. So how do we find non-governmental organizations or other victims advocates who can help these girls get the services they need to break free from this slave lifestyle? Unfortunately, it takes about two to three, four times for them engaging in a victim's counsel or victim's advocate uh, before they actually have the courage to walk away. And some of that is, that's all, maybe all they know. The average age of a traffic victim is between 13 and 14 years old. So they're embarrassed, they don't know what to do. They sit down with these victim advocates and victim counselors, they start opening up about the lifestyle they've been living, where they've been going and what they've been doing. Well that, as you might expect from a law enforcement perspective, is a treasure trove of information. So we're trying to figure out how we tap into that. Those relationships though paid off. So we um, were approached by a service provider uh, in near Mission, Texas, down in the valley along the border with me the Mexico-Texas border. And they had a young victim who told them that she had been uh, forced to work at a permitted location and had been forced to enter uh, to be a prostitute. Uh, so we started the investigation based upon the complaint that came in through a service organization. We quickly realized that we needed our other law enforcement partners, um, the FBI and Homeland um, Security to come in with us because what we figured out, and it was interesting because you meet this lady, uh, Rita Martin Martinez, who's the operator owner of Rita's Sports Bar, uh, you would think she's a, an abuela, somebody's grandmother, getting ready to offer you some cookies. But I will tell you, she's a face of evil, right? They didn't go to work as a maid somewhere. They didn't go to work on a ranch hand. They were forced and held in locked rooms to work in her bar, to flirt with customers, uh, to end up prostituting themselves. And her son was the enforcer. Her son was a member of a gang, uh, cartel gang member, and so he helped Rita track down um, victims, these women who tried to escape, bring them back, beat them, and make an example of them to the others so the others wouldn't escape. The FBI and Homeland Security was involved because we figured out the trail that Rita had trafficked some of these girls to other traffickers in Chicago, Florida, and across the United States, much far beyond our jurisdiction and capability to handle. What we were able to do is shut down the bar. Um, both of these have been arrested for felonies, and we're pr pursuing the asset forfeiture uh, on their locations. My hope was, and coming here today, was to talk about these examples of our success at TABC and I, you can take those back and figure out if there are ways you can use them, but more importantly, as a community, bring those examples back where you're successful and, and help us. Human trafficking is not something, is not a battle that we can afford to lose. Uh, we need your help, I need your help. So if there's somebody out there who has a better idea, I encourage you to reach out to us and help us because uh, this is, is mo nothing more than modern day slavery and although my focus is on Texas, it's not just a Texas problem. Thank you for your time and your attention. So in San Antonio, Texas, we partnered with the Sheriff's Office and the Fire Marshal on a sexually oriented business uh, where we knew that they had underage girls dancing. Uh, so the fire marshal actually went in and did the inspection for us 
Um, and then we went in after him and closed them down. The challenge was all we could do was pull their alcohol permit. Um, they were open the next day as a BYOB, sexual oriented dancing location. The fire marshal went back in and found violations and was able to shut them down from occupancy. So yes, uh, every opportunity we have to uh, engage with those folks we have, but I've not thought about uh, extending that training to them. So that's a great idea. Thank you for sharing. So uh, we welcome all partnership opportunities. I will tell you that most of the NGOs we work through with and through is through the Office of the Governor Child Exploitation Team. Uh, I, I do know at least two international organizations that have partnered with the governor's office. And so we try to work with them, but really anybody that, that can help us um, make a dent on this and identify, and, and for us, we're, we're focusing on the law enforcement issues. So how do I flag a location for a potential operation if I don't have a complaint? You know, we have, rest we have limitations on our capability and we have other, uh, public safety missions out there. However, uh, we recently stood up a criminal intelligence unit to just do, do just that, was to try to pull in information so that we can identify when human traffickers occur in a location and maybe when they're there because, again, it becomes problematic if, if, uh, if I can only hit them, if I know they're gonna be there Friday and Saturday night or I've got some chatter, then I'll know that. Otherwise, we're just kind of throwing a dart at the dartboard hoping they're there that weekend because the traffickers have become fairly sophisticated. They move these girls around. Talking to my counterparts in uh, Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama, they know there's a trail that runs from Texas all the way over to Florida and back as they move these girls back and forth across the South. So yeah, I, I welcome the opportunity. Thank you. I know in uh, Houston, we work with the Human Trafficking Reliance, um, Resource Alliance, and ICE and Department of State are both partners with us there. We're a kind of unique uh, agency because, it, and from other states, so we actually collect alcohol taxes at the border. So when you bring over alcohol, uh, we have a port of entry employee there that is working with the Customs and Border Patrol uh, to collect tax and issue a stamp. So we have folks at each one of the 28 land bridges. Um, and so we have a really good relationship with ICE and CBP, but we do need to develop that further. And so I appreciate that comment. My experience is it's both. Yeah, it depends on different parts of, the, of our state. You have different types of influences. One of the things we were able to pattern was uh, in the sexually oriented business, the dance clubs in San Antonio, they were going to the panhandle of Texas recruiting these disenfranchised teens. And they were bringing them down there and then moving them around. And once they got control of them, uh, it was difficult for them to break free. Uh, in Harris County, they had some, some different issues going on. I'll tell you the story of uh, my chairman's partner. Uh, my chairman is, uh, runs a multi-billion dollar company of financial, uh, financial business. His partner has been with him 30 years, had a high school age daughter. She was driving down I-10 during the middle of the day and her car broke down. So they had AAA, she called, and while she was waiting for the, the record driver to show up, somebody showed up behind, pulled up behind her, approached the window and said, look, I'm from the, the record company. I'll take you to the repair location because uh, it's going to be a while before the record gets here. We don't want you to be out here waiting. Well, she called. She'd already called her dad, and then she called the record company back and said, did y'all send someone out here? And they said, no, don't get in the car with them. Thankfully, she had not rolled down her window very far, and when the record driver did show up a few minutes later, they, he got in his car and took off. But it can be just that quick, someone disappear, and, and you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge. So how, how do you counter that? I mean, we, you have both uh, domestic and international coming into Texas, and I'm sure California and Florida also, it's not just Texas, um, but the labor is, is an issue. And so uh, where we have seen that in Texas is the nail salons for whatever reason. And it can be both men and women 
but it's typically the same kind of behavioral characteristics, right? They don't have cash, they don't have a phone. If they use a phone, they have to have, be in the presence of somebody else. They're scared to talk to you. Um, and those are behavioral things that investigators are, even the public can sometime notice, uh, but the challenge is getting more eyes and ears out there so that we know where to go focus. Because they'll be there, especially labor, they'll be there two weeks and then they're gone and they're on the other side of the state. So it, it becomes problematic. Yeah, and that's a great question. I'm not aware, I know that uh, Human Health and Services uh, has an education program for first responders and doctors to identify human trafficking. But I, again, I'm not aware of any authority they would have to try to hold somebody uh, either voluntarily or against their will. Now they can offer them the opportunity to get to a safe house, to a service provider, but if they don't want to go, it's a challenge. Uh, and, you know, for example, so we in Austin rolled up three locations with the FBI. We rescued 31 girls that night. We took them to a service provider safe house. Uh, and I think we actually rolled up uh, what they call the bottom girl. Uh, so there, she was a supervisor of them. Uh, so we weren't, they weren't being arrested, but we wanted to talk to them to try to figure out if we could make the human trafficking case against these three locations. Uh, and before, within 30 minutes, they had a lawyer show up and, at three o'clock in the morning at this location, which they should not have known about and wouldn't have known about, and then convinced the girls not to talk to us and they all left with them. And you're like, really? I, I mean, uh, I was like, how did they get, the, how did they, you know, why don't we take the phones? Well, you can't take their phones. They're not being arrested. How do we prevent this? Yeah, so. And, and they all went back, and then by the time we went back to the location, they were gone elsewhere, and we're not sure where. What we find is 60% of all human trafficking has some nexus to a permitted location, whether it be a hotel, a bar, a restaurant. So it's naturally within our jurisdiction. Plus, the governor and the legislature has said, TABC, since you're out there, we want you to one, they put it in our alcohol beverage code, making it one of our uh, seven public safety missions. Two, they gave us some funding, which was great because we were doing it out of Hyde. Uh, and we work on a two year biennial budget. Um, so we're not the only ones doing it, but we're kind of on the, the tip of the spear because if it occurs in one of those locations, and I think I mentioned this, but maybe not, the human trafficking hotline. So they've identified five venues where human trafficking tends to occur. The Texas Alcohol Beverage Commission in Texas regulates three of those. So, you know, if it's a target-rich environment, we want to get out there and get after it and try to get them out of our area. And I'm not sure what the progression is, quite frankly. Do we push them out of the bars and restaurants and they go to the BYOB locations? And then how do we handle that? You know, and how do we move them out of our state? Uh, unfortunately, then that means Louisiana, Oklahoma, and New Mexico are gonna to have to figure out how to deal with it. But um, Texas is a big state, we have a lot of geographical and population challenges that tend to enhance our underlying problems. One of the challenges I think we continue to have is a flawed public perception that this is a victimless crime. So they think that somehow these girls are simply wanting to be prostitutes and wanting to engage in this lifestyle uh, and it's a uh, exchange versus an exploitation. Uh, the challenge is uh, they don't realize that these folks are trapped into this lifestyle and it's difficult for them to get out. Um, but I do, and, and because of that, I think there are a lot of areas that are in denial. You know, um, my, my boss's daughter, she lived in, in Memorial, which is a very affluent area. The um, in April, and I think I mentioned this when I was talking, so in April last year, we conducted a multi-jurisdiction operation out of Katy, Texas, which is a fluent suburb outside of Houston. Uh, over the period of time, we arrested 47 people for human trafficking and trafficking-related violations. It happens everywhere. And, and you know, I was just talking to a mayor of a small Texas town. He goes, well, my police chief says it's not happening here. I'm like, well, 
You know, if it's not happening here, that means that your children are at risk of being recruited or abducted and taken down to the major metropolitan areas where it is happening. And that's a challenge. I think you still have a lot of people that don't understand the, the width and breadth of this problem and how it touches everybody. And we'll continue to touch everybody until we get, our, get a handle on it and, and try to make it by the, by the awareness campaign, we're trying to remove the ability of the human traffickers to operate freely, right? Try to restrict them so people start recognizing them. Uh, but the other part is, part is, how do we use an economic model if we can put enough pressure on the trafficker and that um, enterprise model that they have, uh, we cause them to raise the price. And they might price themselves out of the market in some areas. And so then it becomes a much more restricted problem and we can probably deal with it easier. But right now, it's, it's everywhere. And, and it's not, uh, we're just putting our, we're not even putting our fingers in the dike um, yet, in my opinion.